He's not going to talk for two sessions as was written in the program. Uh, we'll have just one session run, but we'll going to have it as long as you like. Actually, as long as you have any questions. <laughs> Hopefully you have any questions. Uh, but without further ado, let's move. Think of this as a kind of flashback to the 1960s. Uh, you're a little too young to remember Marshall McLuhan first time round, but this is like Marshall McLuhan take two and how it's happened. Because we're often told nowadays that under the impact of the marvelous new technologies by which we're surrounded, that we now live in a borderless world, in a globalized world characterized by unprecedented rates of mobility, by the experience of what's called time-space compression, resulting from the increase of speed in communications and transport links. And as soon as I say that, that's rather like McLuhan's notion of how we were going to live in a world of what he called all at onceness in the global community that he was envisaging in the 1960s. A global village of instantaneity. Now, certainly, I'm happy to recognize that new technologies and global cultural flows transgress the boundaries around our nations, our localities, our homes. The porousness of those borders uh, can be seen to produce what you might call a kind of domestication of elsewhere, insofar as those media continually flood us with images of other places that we haven't been to, but we know about them already. You go to New York and you've already seen it. You know what is going to be there. You're familiar with these things. There's a kind of global iconography of stars and places and settings, like the sights of the world, the global familiar. But I think it would be wrong to mistake the reach of those media for their power because that global familiar often has a rather thin presence, diluted by local contexts of reception. Moreover, whatever range of imagery they might be familiar with, an awful lot of people have a rather restricted sense of the horizons of action within which they can, in fact, effect things. That begins to say that global cultural forms still have to be made sense of through local forms of life. Now, in some versions of the kind of abstracted sociology of the postmodern that's sometimes presented under the banner of cultural studies these days, the further presumption is that all of this is increasingly determined by the effects of the new media, by the magical powers of today's new media. And from that kind of perspective, following McLuhan, then the principal task would be to identify the essence of today's media, and then we can deduce their effects from that essence. The problem with that, simply put, is that although some of the theorization of the philosophical dimensions is very sophisticated, in the end, it relies on an utterly outmoded presumption of hypodermic effects. It goes back to a notion that media and technologies just do things to us. Now, if you followed the history of media research since about the 1970s, you'll know that there's a vast array of work, and if you haven't followed it one day, probably you're going to have to if you're studying here, I don't know. But there's a vast array of work that says that simply isn't how media work. Media have all kinds of peculiar redirections, people use them in strange ways, they interpret them in ways they weren't intended, they use technologies for purposes they weren't designed for, they do simply do not have effects. It is absolutely absurd to imagine that the new digital media of our age, for some reason, are exempt from that general proposition. They have effects on us no more than did cinema, no more than did television. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of how, at the point at which cinema is invented in the late 19th century, an audience of people sitting as you are 
watching a film of a train coming into a station suddenly jump back because they imagine they'll be run over. And of course we laugh at that now and how silly and naive they were. Yeah? And a hundred years from now, people will look back at us and our contemporary beliefs about technology. And, oh, really? Is that what they thought? How quaint. Yeah. There is no reason to give us exemption from those historical truths. We have to see our present experiences in historical perspective. We also, I want to suggest, need to understand these things in context, how they work out in particular settings, in particular places. A theory of cyberspace in general is going to get us absolutely nowhere, I would suggest. What we have to understand is how cyberspaces are instituted differently in different geographical and cultural locations and are articulated differently with local networks of communication. By way of example, I'd point, for instance, to some of the work that the anthropologists like Danny Miller and Don Slater have done. For instance, they have a book. They looked at the specific use of the mobile phone and the internet in different parts of the Caribbean. And what they're interested in is how the capacities of those technologies are used and inflected differently in cultures which have specific characteristics, like in some parts of the Caribbean, an incredibly intense oral culture built into the structure of everyday life. Okay, so now you've got oral culture on a mobile phone. That's different from mobile phones in other places where those kinds of oral cultures are not so well developed. To give another example of the ways in which technologies do or do not have effects, Slater tells a story about uh, internet technology in West Africa where he was studying. And he takes the case of two different villages in the same region. In the warm village, they got a lot of funding from UNESCO, the United Nations Educational Thing. And they were able to have a purpose-built computer center with high-class computers, fast modems, a good connection, and indeed an air-conditioned uh, space to avoid damage to the equipment through moisture and so on. But the sad thing was that where they built it was a little bit um, out of the way from where the villagers tended to go. Uh, they hadn't a real reason to go there other than to visit this centre. It was really badly underused. It didn't seem to kind of make much difference at all to people's lives. But in another, another village not far away, there was a guy, an American guy, who'd been there uh, as part of the Peace Corps, you know, this thing where you can volunteer to, 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 to help poor people in the third world. You go to the Peace Corps and you spend a year doing good uh, in this particular place. Anyway, he's coming to the end of his year there, and he had an old laptop uh, that um, he, there was no point in taking it back to the States. It was out of date, it was breaking down, it wasn't much use. But he'd made friends with a guy who ran a cafe. Um, and the cafe was at the place where the bus stops and the taxi ranks are, where all the people from the local villages had to go through on their way to market or on their way home. So this guy puts this clapped out piece of crappy old technology in his cafe, because he'd been giving it for free, let people use it. And you know, guess what? That one makes much more difference to people's lives because it plugs in to the pre-existing systems of communication, both orally and in terms of transport links. And later on, I may bore you with the question of transport, which isn't much discussed usually within communications and cultural studies, but that's where we're heading in this paper. So, just to sort of make some uh, introductory remarks there about how technology does not, in fact, have predictable consequences anywhere, and you cannot deduce the effects of a medium or a technology from its essence. Uh, all right, now, I, I'll, as I go on, I, I'll use examples to try and illustrate points, and sometimes they'll be outlandish. You think, oh, well, but here's one. Uh, the mobile phone. Uh, I don't know how many of you have any football supporters here, but you may know that in some countries, 
um, the fans have a habit of trying to throw things at the players of the opposing team when they come near the edge of the pitch to, to take a corner or something, you know? Which is clearly a dangerous business. But, and the usual thing people throw is like a coin. But if you've ever tried to throw a coin, it's very, very hard to throw it accurately. It's not heavy enough. The wind blows it in the wrong direction. You've got to be a really good shot to hit the referee on the head from 100 yards with, with, with a coin. However, if you want to repurpose a different technology, supposing you had an old mobile phone that you didn't care about anymore because it's crap that you care about. That's a wonderful thing to throw. It's just the right weight. You can aim it perfectly. It's not going to get deflected in the wind. It's not just a story. I don't know if there are any Galatasaray or Fenerbahce fans here, but Istanbul fans are particularly uh, uh, keen on throwing things at opposing players, as you can sometimes see if you watch on the, on the European League on, on, on the television. Outside, but... Okay, and it's known they do that. So there are police searches at the gates for you know, things they might dangerously throw at people. The one thing the police can't take is your mobile phone. Oh, come on, man, you're going to take my mobile phone? For, you don't know. There is a trade in second-hand, unwanted, non-functional mobile phones that people buy specifically for the purposes of throwing. Right. Now, it's a very strange thing you could say to do with a mobile phone. But I just want to show you just, you know, it's not just, you know, everybody knows the story about how when the mobile phone was invented, they thought that text messaging was going to be a very minor function. It was only thought that it was going to be of use for people like traveling salesmen who needed to get back a message to their central office to see if they had 40 litres of oil in store for the next grocery shop rather than 50. They thought it was a really minor thing. They had nobody expected that text messaging would become the major purpose of the mobile phone at a certain stage. Of course, that's changed now. So, technologies have variable uses. It depends on context. It depends how they're incorporated into context. One of the other um, supposed truths of the kind of abstracted sociology of the postmodern that passes for new media theory these days has it is a notion that as is the era in which geography has died. You can go back to Meyerowitz's famous book from the 1980s, No Sense of Place, the idea that the media mean that they give us access to information and persons in other places other than the geographical one in which we are, so that we are no longer in places in the same way that we used to be. You know, he's talking about a history in which, you know, let's say if we take it back a long way, you live in some medieval village, an awful lot of your whole life and of what you can know about and who you can meet and who you can be in contact with is determined by your geographical position. You are in that place in a different way. And I, I want to suggest he's entirely right that our relation to place is now different. What I want to suggest is wrong is the un interrogated extrapolation of that, which is now widespread uh, in uh, the realms of cultural theory, which presumes that uh, we now simply have a virtual existence, that the era of virtual geography has replaced the era of material geography. Mackenzie Walk has that in his book about that, has a phrase some years back about how we no longer have roots, we have aerials. We have terminals. We, are, we're, we live in the world of computer flows. The world of materiality is, the corporeality is uh, uh, old fashioned. Meat space, as Gibson would have it. So the virtual becomes the kind of exclusive dimension of an awful lot of contemporary theory. 
Now, I don't mean to say that that's entirely wrong. 20 years ago, Kevin Robbins and I wrote a book called Spaces of Identity, and part of our purpose was to bring attention to the newly emerging electronic landscapes, as we called them, that are now overlaid on the physical landscape. But we certainly had no intention of suggesting that material geographies no longer counted. I want to suggest that material geographies continue to have a profound importance, even if we inhabit physical territories in different ways than perhaps most people did in the past. This notion of a co-presence of multiple worlds, of the virtual and the material and the cultural, is not new. Margaret Morse was talking about this in the 1980s, talking about travelling through physical locations while virtually visiting far-flung worlds through a variety of screen representations. She described, you know, driving your car down the motorway, listening to the radio. You're already in different places simultaneously. In the back of your car these days, probably your children are in different places from you because they're locked into a virtual world of a video game or whatever. There are all kinds of worlds in the car. The motorway is a strange kind of world in itself. To what extent is this a geographical phenomenon? It doesn't follow geographical logic. You don't turn right because the town is on the right. You go the way the motorway flow system sends you. And the network of the motorway is very different from the topology of the landscape. <coughs> what I'm interested in is the way in which new technologies, and newness is a historical constant, you know, everything was once new and so on and so forth. The new technologies continually get domesticated and inscribed into our everyday lives. What I'm interested in is trying to propose a way to think about how we inhabit that world, how we weave these new technologies into our lives. But I certainly am trying to suggest there's a big problem with the sort of boosterist cyber hype that pictures a dematerialized and disembodied virtual realm unfettered by the constraints of physics, geography, or bodily flesh. And if you think about it, as Margaret Wertheim says, that vision of cyberspace has a curious similarity to the Christian idea of heaven. It's a transcendent space in which you're freed from the limitations of the body. You enter the realm of true happiness. This is a very odd thing to discover. Religious metaphors built into the discourse of cyberspace shouldn't be surprising. Hermann Bausinger, in his book from 1992 about folk cultures in a world of technology, is already talking about how the world of what was then new technology is riddled with old ideas. Certainly, in uh, Nigeria in particular, it's well known that if a witch wants to make trouble for you, what she may do is steal your SIM card while you're asleep and insert on it the numbers of another person who your partner does not know about who will then have inscribed embarrassing messages on your phone and the witch will leave it open at a place at which your husband or wife or partner is likely to see it. I mean, how evil is that? But that's an everyday presumption in certain parts of Nigeria. If you've ever seen Nollywood films, they are full of the most extravagant stuff. But they're no more extravagant than the absurd Western bankers and so on who come on and spout unbelievable witchcraft about development and uh, uh, progress and uh, employment and uh, uh, how uh, this government, unlike all the previous governments, is not corrupt. And of course the oil minister was not 
doing anything wrong when he gave the entire oil field to his son-in-law. It's just, just a mistake, you know, just a bureaucratic mistake. Technology malfunctioned and we sorted it out. Behind there, perhaps, you begin also to hear another thing which partly comes from a historical perspective. It partly comes from the work of Fernand Braudel and the Annal School, where they talk about having to understand history as having simultaneously different times, that we live on different time scales simultaneously. Very complex, very useful analytical device. Bruno Latour puts it more simply. If you look at the book that he does with Michel Serre about we have never been modern, about how we are all mixers and brewers of times, Latour gives a very simple example. He talks of himself putting up a, she putting up a shelf in his Paris apartment one Saturday afternoon. And he says, look at what I'm doing. I'm using a, a cordless electric drill, very recent fancy new technology, but for some of my activities, I'm using a hammer, which is a paleolithic tool. Yeah? It's been with us for a long time. I'm talking about it to my wife on the mobile phone to make sure that it was there that she wanted the shelf and not there. And we're having a row about it because I misunderstood her. But we've got a whole, yeah, he gives you a sense of the way in which we're all simultaneously living in different times, using technologies from different periods. And those technologies are creating more and more forms of symbiosis between themselves. They're dancing around each other, finding ways to survive. If you think back to the moment in which cinema imagined it was going to be killed by television in the 1950s, and you think about all the techniques that cinema developed, making spectacular films bigger than television can show with more profound special effects and so on, it found a new place so it could survive alongside television. Now we're told this is going to be the era of the death of television. What's television doing? It's busily publicizing the website at the end of the program. It's encouraging you to tweet about the television program. It's finding ways to live alongside these new media. We live and will continue to live in these mixtures. We are the people who are making the brew. And to think of us living in this media era and then that media era and then the next media era is just nonsense. What about territories? I think. We have to also now consider both material and symbolic territories, offline and online territories. We have to think not of the actual as being replaced by the virtual, and not of the actual as if it were the real being replaced by the fake, we have to think of the actual and the virtual as both modes of the real, which are now are articulated together in different ways. I've been doing this stuff uh, a very long time. Um, that's how I lost my hair. Uh, I began in an era in which television was uh, the thing. You know, when I was a child, television was the exciting medium. Grew up te the television era, the late 20th century. One of the things that was still assumed at the point in the 1970s in which I came into media research, and assumed for good reason, was that television principally addressed a national audience. So something like Stuart Hall's encoding, decoding paper is a way to understand how the British 
to have different sections of the British television audience understand British television, yeah? You can say that built into that kind of model is what you might call a sedentarist metaphysics, a notion of stability of audiences of people who are in one place automatically, addressed only or largely by the broadcasting systems of the state which has legal ownership of that territory. That's what the whole debate in UNESCO was about in the 1960s, the notions of communication sovereignty and defending national space against the encroachment of whether it's the Americans or whoever else. Clearly, that kind of model needs quite a lot of adaptation now. We now live in an era in which things have changed. Nations have lost such communication sovereignty as they had. And there is, in some ways, more transborder mobility, both of messages and of audiences. To that extent, a lot of very good work now takes its cue from the intervention of people like John Urry and the development of the New Mobility School at Lancaster University. Other people, for good reason, have been very much influenced by Arjuna Padurai's concept of the increased rate of flows, not only of culturally mediated materials, but also of people across the world. So, Padurai talked at a certain point about how nowadays, and he's still talking about television principally at this point, this is 1992, we have to analyse a situation where moving images meet deterritorialized viewers in a new context of motion and mediation. Yeah, it's a world in which everything is in motion, he's suggesting. But I think we have to insert some caution there. A patriarchal stress is on the way in which the mobility of the media and of people sort of amplifies each other, an increasingly mobile and fractured world. But the problem is that actually there's more to it than that. We have to think of also the situations where there are relatively sedentarist populations of people who do still, on the whole, inhabit the same national territory. And we have to remember how very much television is still consumed in national forms, within national borders. And if you think that's different in the internet, just try clicking on a the relevant apps, you will find that an awful lot of internet traffic takes place either within national boundaries or within perfectly understandable boundaries. If you go on the uh, Facebook application, which Zlatan once sent me, uh, which shows you who's friends with who in which countries, you start from a given country, you know, it's very predictable where people have friends. It's limited by language and it's limited by the roots of laid down by imperial contact. It relates to roots of migration. It, it, is, an, it, it is the transposition of the history of world empire into cyberspace. It's not boundaryless. It's simply got boundaries in different places from where it had them before. The point being, Apagera is right that spatial localization, quotidian interaction, and social scale are by no means always isomorphic. They don't always fit together. That's why he talks about disjunctures between ethnoscapes and mediascapes. The fact that it's so much easier for media images to cross borders than it is for many people. 
But, as Peter A.D. puts it, if mobility is everything, then it is nothing. This generalized model of a mobile world isn't actually going to help us very much because we have to think about what Doreen Massey calls the power geometry of mobility. Who is mobile? Which categories of persons are mobile across which range? Who has control of the mo their mobility? Who chooses to be mobile? Who is forced into mobility by circumstance? Who, as Ulf Hannertz Potts puts it, becomes an involuntary cosmopolitan, having to learn a new language because they had to leave their country of origin and get a job somewhere else, and they've got to learn that language, even to drive a taxi, even if where they came from they were an engineer. Yeah? There are different mobilities. People are differently mobile, and they have different access to forms of virtual mobility as well. What we need is a power geometry of how those things work. Zygmunt Bauman tells a very nice story about um, this thing where, I mean, one of the great delights of being an academic, if you like, go to places, is it's really easy, like you go to the airport and somebody comes with a car and meets you. It's great, you know, hassling for a taxi or whatever. He's telling a story, he goes to the airport somewhere and somebody from the conference he's going to t t meets him and takes him to the conference. And it's quite a long ride, um, you know, 45, 50 minutes. It's somewhere in, uh, in East Asia. And come the day he's going back home, he needs to get back to the airport and he knows that the person who brought, who took him, is very busy that day. So he says, no, 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 I won't t take a lift, it's fine. And he gets a taxi. And the taxi gets him to the airport in 15 minutes. Because the taxi driver knows the city in a different way from the academic. Knows of places you can go and shortcuts you can take, which are very different from the driver that he had on the way there. The cities we live in we inhabit in different ways. There are narratives to the city. There are mediatized cities. We've got to think about the relation between these different dimensions and scales of our activity. And we mustn't get carried away with these ideas of us all being mobile. I know Britain's a strange place because I live there. But 50% of people in Britain still live as adults within, f more than 50%, still live as adults within five kilometers of where they were born. Most grandparents in Britain claim to see their grandchildren at least once a week. That tells you there are very, very low rates of mobility, both within and between generations. Okay, you think, Britain's a weird place. How about somewhere like America, the land of the free that we all associate with mobility? The latest studies of mobile phone usage uh, in the States, which give you a very good graph of people's mobility, say that most people rarely go outside of a 20 kilometer radius from their home. Rarely at all. And the mobile phone is mainly used not to be in contact with people far away, but to reschedule local activities. So having a mobile phone doesn't make you more mobile or more in contact. It makes you able often to live a more intensely local life. For all of those reasons, I'm here trying to suggest that the way media and communication studies has developed over the last 50 years or so with its increasing emphasis simply on symbolic media methods of transmitting information is a mistake that we need to go back to the older definition of communications which in Marx's words should concern the movement of information persons 
and commodities. Physical movement alongside virtual movement. Now, it's certainly true that changes in transport speed and efficiency, reducing transport costs, principally in the realm of container shipping, is the bedrock of globalization. Without that, you can't have globalization. That's what time-space compression is founded on. It's the key driving force of the global economy. But guess what? Although the discussion of time-space compression in our field is a relatively recent you know, thing, perhaps since the 1980s, any respectable historian will be able to explain to you that time-space compression has a very, very long history. It's been going on for three or four centuries at least. And some of the changes in those times, such, for instance, as the arrival of the railways and the steamships in the same part of the late 19th century, were much more revolutionary than anything we've seen today. If you look at the work of people like Stephen Kern, you can see that rates of change, or David Edgerton, rates of change in physical mobility and in communications efficiency are much proportionally faster in the late 19th century than they are now. So, okay. So we've got a process of time-space compression and of speed up as a general idea of what's happening to us. I'm telling you that we have to understand it in historical perspective. We mustn't get carried away with what's happening to us this week. But we also have to understand that it works in very complicated ways. <coughs> Contradictory ways, even. You know, yes. Everybody knows that the main function of the internet is to uh, throw spam around. But once you get rid of the spam function, the main thing that the main statistical big category of email has nothing to do with transcending geographical distance. The second biggest category of email traffic is between persons in the same organization, often in the same building. That's what email is. That's principally, statistically, what email is. It's an intensification of communications between people who are already in contact, often in the same place. Indeed, in my own experience at Goldsmiths, in the same corridor. Yeah? They're emailing me from next door. Hello? And this can get quite um, troubling. I was in Taiwan not so long ago, and I met this a young woman who was very, very concerned about her young... She had three younger brothers who all seemed to be getting caught up in this... Um, there's a, a phrase that's sometimes used about a, a, a computer culture in East Asia. They talk about otaku uh, culture. It was partly to do with the word for the thumb, but it's partly to do with this notion of boys, and I'm sorry guys, but it is usually boys, who get so caught up in computer life that that's all they do. They retreat to their bedrooms and just stay on the keyboard all day. Yeah? Reliant on their mothers or sisters or whatever to bring them some food and do their laundry. In this girl's case, the three brothers who were all in this otaku thing, they just didn't go out at all, who got to the point where if one of them wanted to go and like have a shower in order to check that he wasn't going to inconvenience anyone else. They did it by email within the house, the message system within the house, rather than actually talk to each other. These are, these are strange geographies. These are strange worlds in which we move. The one thing that's not true is that cyberspace is beyond geography. For one thing, on the whole, it relies on a very clear material infrastructure. It largely relies on the undersea cables that were laid in the late 19th century across the oceans. When I went to Australia not long ago, there was a panic going on because the internet was down 
right across Australia and part of Indonesia. The simple explanation for it was that a ship coming into the entrance of the Suez Canal had scraped its hull across one of the cables, the cables that were laid by the British under sea to reach through Suez to India and then later on to Australia. This marvelous new system depends on a very old material infrastructure. It's not virtual. The cloud is not a vague thing in the sky. It's a bloody great industrial plant pumping out a lot of emissions in a huge identifiable place. Far from cyberspace being beyond geography, it has its own very clear geography. If, like people like Matthew Zook, you do geographies of cyberspace and you do a map of the internet density per square kilometer all over the globe, it'd be a very familiar map. You know, there's lots of intense lighting comes up on the map in particular cities, in particular areas of cities, and there are lots of areas of the world where there's very little internet access. It has a very clear structure, a very clear geography. Even more curiously, the internet industry itself is one of the most geographically concentrated industries that exist. It exists in very small particular areas of particular cities. If you want to get involved in internet industry in London for the last five years, either you had your base in Shoreditch or Hoxton in East London, or you were dead. No chance. Why? The internet industry depends on a very, very particular informal set of networks of access to technological, cultural and professional competence. It involves people making really scary decisions like giving God knows how many hundreds of thousands of pounds to some kid barely out of college who's got a, what might be a fantastic business plan, could be the next Mark, next Mark Zuckerberg, could be a disaster. If you're making that investment decision, you want to know that person. You want to have seen them. You want to have seen them around. You want to be sure who they're friends with. You want to know whether you could trust them. If you're hiring someone to do a job, you don't put an advert in the paper. You know, you need to know in which cafe, in which part of Hoxton, you're liable to hear about a good deal or a good project. You have to be there physically. It is incredibly concentrated and for very good reasons. Sometimes people talk about a process of deterritorialization. One of the examples they often give of deterritorialization is call centers. Like if I'm in London and I want to know what time's the next train to Birmingham and I ring up, I'm going to be some talking to someone who says, hello, my name is blah, blah, and they'll use an English name. In fact, it'll be an Indian person. It'll be somewhere in India. British call centers tend to be in India. That is not deterritorialization. That is re-territorialization, because British call centers are in India and not just anywhere, for the very good reason that the British Empire bequeathed the particular combination of a good range of English language skills and a low-wage economy to India. It's for exactly the same reason that the French and the Spanish have their call centers in North Africa. This is not deterritorialization. This is re-territorialization, which is perfectly explicable according to the history of empire. I talked earlier about the kind of religious dreams that people seem to have at a certain point about the internet and cyberspace as a means of getting away from the body, getting away from the old boring identities and being able to playfully inhabit uh, all these new virtual identities. I think uh, that's um, happily a vision which has faded, people have begun to realize that for most of us, uh, 
the mobile phone, the internet, the smartphone, whatever, is a set of banal overlays on our existing life. They're not fantastic transformations. They're useful. They're dead useful. And they have their problems. But I think the banalization of those technologies is where one needs to look. Because it's when they become banal, overlooked and forgotten that they are perhaps most important to us. I could say something about how um, the one thing nobody is thinking about in the room at the moment is um, electricity. You know? The banal presence of a reliable electricity supply. We completely take it for granted. It's actually, this is the critical, this is the thing that is making our discussion possible. This is a profound and was experienced at the time as a profound change, as a magical change. To us, we just live with it. There are problems with it of different sorts. The question is how we shape it into our lives as much as how it shapes us. Material factors, as I claim, continue to have profound effects. And I think there's a lot to learn by thinking about transport, by thinking in the way in the North American tradition, you'd be thinking about Harold Innes or James Carey or people like that. Within Europe, it's people like Armand Matala who have best developed this perspective, I think. But they're all of them in the business of trying to think again about the materiality of communications. Here we come to a complicated metaphor. As far back as the 1930s, uh, the German art historian Rolf Arnheim proposed that what was then the new invention of television was best understood as a means of transport for the mind, as analogous to the car or the train or the aeroplane Fundamentally, a mode of distribution, but now of images. So, is that better? Okay, sorry. Arnheim's argument, as I say, links to Marx's question about the movement of persons and things as well as ideas. He works at the level of metaphor and transposing the function of the physical modes of transport to the virtual sphere. Where the entities being transported, images and ideas are themselves immaterial. But if you are living in Greece, where you see the word metaphor is on the side of furniture moving vans, metaphoros. That's what a metaphor is. It moves something from one place to another, whether it's an idea or a person or a thing. It's a different way of thinking about communications, a way that restores the broken linkage between the material and virtual dimensions. I mentioned earlier the work of the French political economist Armand Matelas, he goes back to the physiocrats of 18th century France who were very keen on the positive functions of transport in constituting the nation of France. They understood that a nation isn't a thing which happens to have transport in it, that a nation is in some part constructed through its communication links. The metaphor works in lots of ways. When Al Gore at a certain point in the 90s is talking about the information superhighways of the new age, he's referring you back to the superhighways of America, which he takes as a natural fact. America had that highway system 
because during his time in Germany in the Second World War, General Eisenhower had realized very well how much the National Socialist and how effectively the National Socialist had used the construction of the Autobahn system to construct a feeling of German nationness, of German nationality. This is Benedict Anderson, an imagined community, on a whole other scale. The role of transport links in creating geographies. Not geography as a backdrop against which things take place, but the constitution of communities through transport links, by means of transport links, be they material or virtual. The constitution of networks, to move into Castell's territory, which overlay the physical connections, which enable, and in some cases disable, different modes of activity. If you think about Northern Europe and the high-speed train links that are being built across Northwest Europe, they're fantastic if you want to get from London to Brussels or Paris or Frankfurt or even Milan and quite soon Madrid, if not Barcelona. All those places are now in effect closer to each other than they were before. Yeah? At the same moment, as someone living in London, it's now much easier, faster and cheaper for me to get to Paris than it is to get to Newcastle, Liverpool, or Manchester. At the same moment that it brings the major cities of Northwestern Europe into a tighter and more efficient set of connections, it makes other places far away, further away. Britain is disaggregated. The terrifying economic divide between the southeast of Britain and the rest of the country is massively exaggerated by this pull into Europe. high-speed trains is that they're high-speed because they don't stop anywhere. If I go to Paris, one of the things I'm likely to be doing is trying to visit some friends in rural France uh, to the north, uh, east of Bordeaux. There used to be a train I could get overnight from Paris directly, directly to where they live, being eliminated. What I have to do now is I get the high-speed train to Bordeaux. I'm there very quickly. And then I wait for a long time to change onto a slow train that takes me back to where my friends live. So the overall journey time is in fact longer and more inconvenient and more expensive. Yeah? So it's to do with networks and hubs and how, of course, the network facilitates connection between the hubs and by the same token makes it more difficult to communicate between the spokes. You, know, you try getting from one... <sighs> city in what was colonial Western Africa without going through Paris. The fastest route is to go up and down through Paris, not to go across, not to go the way it's geographically close. So networks regulate, constitute, and exclude different categories of people. What is the EU doing? If you think about this Thing they call the Corridor 8 project. This is, this, is, this is extraordinary stuff. They're thinking about communications and the reopening of the Silk Road and the importance of trade with China, constructing transport and communications corridors that reach through the Balkans and the Middle East towards China. This is we're back in the 19th century again. Bismarck's dream was to build a railway from Berlin to Baghdad and then down to the Indian Ocean. This is, this is another version of that scheme of empire and the constitution of territory. Part of that can indeed be recognized as what used to be called the Via Ignatia, down which St. Peter travelled 
which connected Rome to the Middle East in those times. All histories keep coming back. Lisa Parks, the American communications scholar, has done work here in Croatia and Slovenia about mobile phone networks and the extent to which some of them, at a certain point, were replaying and recreating what had been the territorial boundaries of the Habsburg Empire. They are reinventing Habsburg concepts now as markets, not as political constituted divisions, but as market divisions, the same territories. Connexity. Who has access to what? Who can go where? Who has a fast modem? Who has a slow modem? Who has which level of ability with these new technologies? Who is allowed into which place? You know, to go back to the earlier example, Bauman talks about the difference between uh, uh, the cosmopolitans, the rich cosmopolitans who are welcome anywhere uh, 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 as long as they've got a valid credit card, and those people whose visa status is now restricted, that it's very difficult for them to go anywhere at all. Within the Balkans, Ivo Dichev, talking about Bulgaria and elsewhere, he says, you enter a different country depending on your means of transportation. In some cases, there is the glorious descent by plane with nice airports and Europeanized border offices. This, he observes, is the kind of travel experience that encourages people to think that we have arrived at the end of geography. However, he adds, there are also those who make their journeys on the shabby aging trains in which you secure the door with your necktie against intrusions and play card games with strangers on attaché cases. And further down the social ladder, buses full of suitcase traders circulate, asked to get off at each border to stand in a line and open their baggage for checking. And of course, as he says, at the bottom of the transport hierarchy, of those who cross borders on foot, led by obscure guides at night. You can make it more banal. If you look at San Paolo, the middle classes of San Paolo increasingly live in high-rise apartment blocks which have on top a heliport. And they, tr they travel around the city by helicopter from the top of one building to another. And their presence changes the whole soundscape of the city because you hear it all the time. The maids who clean their apartments live in the favelas. And it takes them not 15 minutes to cross the city, not 10 minutes like in a helicopter. It can take them between three and four hours each way on the bus journey from the favela to the apartment that they're cleaning. People live at different speeds. If you're a businessman, if you're a Chinese businessman with a lot of money, you get on a plane and you go to the States and you're there in 12 hours. One of the best established routes of illegal migrancy from China generally takes about 15 months because the migrants have to go on a very, very peculiar geographical journey which is chosen in terms of the relative weakness of border restrictions in different places at different times. To optimize their journey, they have to go very slowly. To that extent, you might say that we have to think some more not just about mobility, but also about its converse, waiting, stasis. We could say that the amount of waiting that a person does is a very good index of their social status. Yeah? Hence the fast queue at the airport. Yeah? The privilege queue. But it's not just people if we go back to commodities, as I said, the key to the global economy is container shipping. 
Globalization, we've been told, is to do with time-space compression and increased speed. But the funny thing is that the very latest container ships are being built to go slower and slower because it's cheaper that way. They get less hassle about fuel emissions and it's cheaper. They're more concerned about fuel costs. And anyway, the long distance supply chains on which globalization has been premised are now in question in a different way. A lot of that, I don't, you're probably none of you familiar with the work of Alan Sekula, but if you ever come across it, do take it very seriously. He's one of the first people who's understood how central shipping is to the contemporary world. And of course we don't see it. Why don't we see it? Because it's mainly container ships and container ports have to be out of town because they're too big to get in your old port. Thing about shipping is um, it has key strategic points. If you can get hold of an old-fashioned map from the 19th century, and we have a lot of these in Britain, there's a very strange one where all the British Empire is marked in pink on the map. And it's in really weird places when you first look at it. Yes, it's in Britain. Okay, fine. They own Scotland, they own Wales, and all the rest of it. Then, there's a little pink bit on the edge of Gibraltar, you know? A tiny bit, edge of Gibraltar. There's another pink bit around where the Suez Canal is, at the north end of the, the Gulf. And then there's another pink bit around Aden, at the bottom of that, where it goes into the, to, to the Indian Ocean. And then, there was always another pink bit around Singapore, just over the Strait of Malaccas. And there was this funny place called the Falkland Islands, round near the route that takes you under Latin America. That was what the British Empire was about, the control of key shipping points. Yeah. Now, what you find in a number of those places where there was pink is a different color. If you look at the insurance map of the world, that's where there's piracy. The piracy and the pirates are operating with GPS, all lots of very fancy technology, is driving the insurance costs of the shipping industry higher and higher. Thank you. So the routes are changing, the forms are changing, and the relationship between the material and the virtual is changing, but they're both there. You can't forget the one and just talk about the other. If we think about the city, and mobility within the city, and the role of the media within the city, Nick Cauldry and Anna McCarthy talk about how electronic media increasingly saturate our everyday spaces with images of other places, imagined or real. It is more and more difficult to tell a story of social space without also telling a story of media, and vice versa. So the emerging picture is not of the collapse of place, but of the more subtle integration of other places and agents into the flow of our everyday life. They're talking about what Nesta Garcia Canclini calls a game of echoes, as it were. Not the substitution of urban material life by audiovisual media. Yes, there are screens all over the city, but they're reflecting things backwards and forwards between the material and the virtual realm. I began by saying that I thought it was important to um, think about not just the relation of online and offline territories, but also beyond the unified notion of cyberspace, to think about cyberspaces and how they were differently articulated in different parts 
of the world, how the virtual is overlaid on the actual in different situations. Let me come in towards an end now. I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, I want to end with the, the question, fascinating uh, question that was raised in some quarters a little while back as to whether Facebook caused the Arab Spring um, or the Iranian, the Green Revolution or whatever it was at another point. Um, I think that's a... I mean, I, the, my, my mind boggles when I'm confronted with that. You're back again with the question I started with of a technology having in itself the magical power to cause major events. If we look at what happened in Cairo in that period, let's not begin with Facebook. Let us recognize that there's a point in the story in which between a small number of very important activists, Facebook was a marvelously effective tool for their self-organization. Yeah, but that's a way down the line. Let's go back to somebody who was referring in this room only a couple of days ago to the eight years of strikes in Egypt that preceded Tahrir Square. That was one I mentioned. Then you have to think about the public sphere in other parts. There was a novel called The Yacoubian Building, which came out in Cairo in that period, only read by the literate uh, 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 upper uh, middle classes, but it had an ironic and disrespectful air to the Mubarak elite, which was a new thing in Egyptian culture. It was then made as a, there was then a television program, version of the Yacoubian building with this kind of ironizing of life under Mubarak and the corruption of it. And then there were a series of chat shows, only late at night, only on some channels, which also began to allow the articulation of a critical discourse about Mubarak's regime. The activists who use Facebook came in at that moment. There was a story already in play. Yes, between some of them, Facebook was very important. Facebook did play a point. Problem is, you can only do so much with Facebook. If you think about the very relatively small proportion of the Egyptian population, which is literate, let alone has access to something like Facebook, you're speaking only of a minority of people. Having begun something and then got it rolling. Have, you, have people seen that film, The Square, that's been produced? There's a film called The Square on Netflix, produced by some of the people involved in Tahrir Square. It's fantastic. Do watch it. That yes, they did use new media for all they could. You know, they, every time someone was beaten, it was very important to them to have you know to have got it a, 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 an image that they could then use and circuit among their circuits to tell people what had happened. But the crucial moment came very physically when they elected a day on which they would each take responsibility for one district of Cairo and go there and start chanting in the streets, trying to get bring people with them like a Pied Piper, and they brought people into the city and they were chanting about the price of bread. They weren't chanting about Facebook. They were chanting about the price of bread. At that point, they got enough people in Tahrir Square to be confident that some of them could then go and surround the Maspero building from which Egyptian television and radio is broadcast. It's about half a mile outside Tahrir Square. And they went and they used the very medieval tactic of laying siege to the building. They physically surrounded it so no one could get in and no one could get out. And after two days, it stopped broadcasting. Now, that's the moment. That's the revolutionary moment when you get Egyptian national television off air. Because up to that point, it had been pumping out pro Mubarak propaganda. I mean, it's just like in Getsy Square, you know, when the famous thing about the Turkish media show a thing about penguins. There's a famous documentary about 
penguins that they put on rather than show what was happening in Getsy Square. That, now, that's, that's not a story. I'm not trying to say uh, Facebook didn't matter. It mattered very much at one stage in that story among one section of people for one purpose. You know? And the key tactic was bodily. It was critical that they occupied, the Occupy protest, the symbolic square of the city. It is, you know, the government, if you control Tahrir Square, if you won't leave, if you are embodied there, you have stayed there, this is a massive thing. But it has to, it's not just anywhere, it's a symbolic place, but it is actually a place. If they were a mile away, it wouldn't have mattered. They're not in Tahrir Square. And that's obviously a kind of exceptional moment and an, you know, an exciting moment and an interesting moment about which many people have, have spoken and written. But I want to just end by going back to the much more banal question of um, encouraging you to think in a more everyday way about the way in which we all live with these new uh, media the way in which we live within and ourselves create networks and trajectories and the way in which the material, the actual, the virtual, the electronic landscapes are for us connected in their various ways, the way in which they echo each other the way in which in some moments they undermine or contradict each other to go back to a pagerized notion of disjunctures. But also, if we want to think about power, I think I would say that technologies have most power, perhaps, when we're least conscious of them. When they become most banal, when they become invisible to us. I mean, but that, and that's, you know, oh, what's he talking about? Obviously, he's talking about, you know, fancy um, things like when Donna Haraway starts talking about how we're all becoming cyborgs, and it all sounds like very, uh, very kind of um, um, space age. Well, many of us have been cyborgs for a very, 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 very long time. Uh, hands up all those of you who haven't got a mobile phone with you. Stay! Quite a big proportion. That's surprising. Most places I talk, uh, uh, people have got them. When I get up in the morning, I'm sure many of my fellow glasses wearers or um, contact wearers will share this. I'm not David Morley the person who functions in the world, until I have incorporated into my existence the technology with which I orientate myself in space and the technology with which I orient myself in time. Now I'm David Morley. Yeah? So I'm already a composite, and I suggest to you that many of you are composites. And we all have been and will continue to be. Those things we don't see, we take for granted. But tracing the process in which, you know, this was fantastic at a certain moment in the Industrial Revolution. If you went into a factory with your own timepiece in Britain, you could get sacked because time belonged to the owner. The owner had the clock that marked the time of your labor. He didn't want individuals being able to question whether he reset the clock as owners often did, to cheat you by making you work an extra half hour. To even have a watch was uh, an extraordinary thing. Of course, well, of course, probably you, presumably, you don't bother with them anymore because you've always got your mobile phone with you most of the time and you can get the time on the mobile phone, so why have a watch? Certainly in London, that's the way my students behave, they don't have watches anymore because they wouldn't go anywhere without their mobile phone. 
where are these technologies in our lives and how are we living with them and how is that related to the circumstances, cultural, economic and political within which we live? Those are the questions I think are worth asking. I don't have any answers, by the way. I'll end there. I'm sorry to have gone on so long, but um, there you go. I'll finish now.